Yeah, yeah. When is the, just, the seminar is in a few minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, uh, okay, just just start and uh, <laughs> we will see what happened. We have a lot of a lot of people here waiting. Szanowni Państwo, zaczynamy. Mieliście wstęp. Okay, we, we had a short short introduction about um, our webinars in uh, during vacation. It's good to see you, uh, Solomon. Thank you to be with us. Sure. Let's share your skin and let's start uh, with okay. presentation. All right. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, open innovation in a time of crisis. And uh, you can you hear me? Yes, everything uh, looks okay. We see your presentation. And, uh, okay, that's very good. Yes, yes. I just wanted to go over and uh, there, then you're saying there are about 39 people there and uh, they're all in business or executives, right? Yeah. Yes. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the open innovation in a time of a crisis like the one we're in now and uh, how open innovation, which is a topic that I teach here at UC Berkeley, along with uh, Professor uh, Henry Chesborough, uh, who is the father of open innovation. Um, and how does, what is open innovation and how does it work and what is the, um, uh, uh, and how does it, uh, how do we deal with some of the circumstances as business people uh, today? And, um, and I want to cover some of these uh, things that uh, maybe, uh, how much time do we have today? Uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it should be about one hour, so uh, tw 20 minutes uh, or, or 30 for presentation and then a Q&A se right. session. Okay, and this is what I prepared and I'm sorry about the confusion and time. Uh, so I think we were, I was late, but I do like to finish if it's possible. And this is what I prepared, which is uh, mainly, uh, this is something that I would send out ahead of time for some of you to think uh, ahead of time before we, uh, before I make my presentation. And uh, one of the things that, uh, the questions that you might be thinking, uh, and usually get a little survey, what, you, what are you selling? Uh, you know, basically, and I like, usually get a two minute introduction from people uh, and, uh, you know, and who are the customers, because it helps me to be relevant to your audience and uh, the, your business activities and your partners. And uh, so this is what I usually go over, but we can skip this. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, um, the um, um, post-COVID world, uh, um, post-COVID-19, uh, it's a World Economic Forum analysis and recommendations. And this is something that we all need to be cognizant of. One of them is uh, we have a lot of things are accelerating this crisis. And what's accelerating this crisis uh, is one thing is interconnectedness of global systems. We always think about interconnect interconnectedness as something that's very positive. Uh, yes, it is positive, but it also has some downside to it. The downside is the interconnectedness uh, in a globalized world uh, you know, with societies and economies, uh, the bad news travels fast. So uh, uh, it is a two-edged sword. The other thing that um, accelerates this global crisis that we're in is proliferation of information on multimedia. We are so well connected and we're all on uh, media 24 seven that uh, sometimes, you know, things are magnified. And that is also uh, causing this global crisis. Um, yes, multimedia is good, uh, you know, but uh, the downside is too much information, especially too much conflicting information that is being reported 20, 24 seven 
he now instills fear in people. And uh, number three is a morphed public health event. What we're saying here is there are many self-interested groups who take the situation we are in, which is a crisis, and turning into their own selfish gains, propaganda or interests. And you see that happening right now in the United States. The downside of taking advantage of crisis for selfish gains by influencers who turn the event, which is a, you know, a sad thing, into a political, economic, and psychological and social crisis. And uh, you know, there, you know, these are things that we need to be aware of if we're business people. And how do you combat this? And uh, um, and and so and there's some of the recommendations are we need to be ready for the next crisis or even in this crisis if we can solve So there are three things that there's readiness for the next crisis, including this one, that uh, the World Economic Forum says. And one is install early warning systems. That's one thing that we learned. This one caught us by surprise to be ready for the future crisis. The second thing is to build digital access as a utility. You know, just like we have electricity in our home and gas stoves and, and plumbing, uh, this is almost like a necessity now, not a luxury or an option. We need to have digital access uh, globally because we are so reliant. Number three, um, develop open innovation partnerships. This is, uh, we'll do a lot more on this one because open innovation partners, partnerships help you in the time of crisis to accelerate a solution. Human beings by their very nature don't want to work with other people. You know, they want to be secretive. They want to be alone. They don't, they're afraid of sharing the trade secrets, business secrets, supply chains. However, in a time like this, you have seen how things, solutions were accelerated because people who normally don't work together started working together within the company and outside of the company. I would even say, one, go one step further and say, we also need to work together with our competitors. We call that co-opetition. We have done at Berkeley many studies on co-opetition and when two competitors work together in the areas of their strengths, the pie increases 10 times. So here we say, when two competitors work together, one plus, is, one plus one is not two, one plus one is 11. And there are many cases, and of course we don't have time in this course, in this uh, session to go over many great examples of that. So don't be afraid to work with your competitors in the areas of uh, the strengths where you can, and that's possible. Now, I just wanted to stop here and ask if, uh, if I'm clear, if you can hear me, and if you can see my slides. Hello? Hello? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? And uh... Yeah, everything is okay. So, sorry. Uh, we, we can hear you. There, there was a, a, s a small problem with, with uh, your microphone, but now it's everything okay. Oh, good. Good. All right. So you can see my slides. Yeah, we can see your slides. Yes. 
uh, U.S. business people who are sitting there with uh, this evening, and uh, I think it's evening there for you, and uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, afternoon for me, um, uh, about 1, 1 p.m. here in California. Um, these are some of the new opportunities for growth that are coming up in the post-COVID-19 world. And if you're a business person, you may want to think about each one of these. I think we need to, uh, if you're a startup or if you have an existing business, these are opportunities for growth. One is voice-based contactless interfaces, interaction, social distancing technologies could create new uh, business uh, opportunities. Uh, the second one is home-based digital infrastructure. For example, for the last, uh, you know, five months, I have been at home. Uh, but I'm teaching around the world, uh, like I'm doing now with my students. I have projects going on all around the world, and I have engagement with many companies uh, in the consulting with their companies. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of, uh, I work with governments in, in India, uh, you know, so we are doing all that from home. So which means if any technology that helps in this area are, are, are support services, it doesn't have to be the technology that we're using right now will be a big opportunity for growth in post COVID-19 world. Number three is real time monitoring using IOT to improve efficiency. This is very, very important. Uh, I was told that uh, many companies, many, India is a big country. For example, we have 1.4 billion people. We have 600,000 students in, uh, 600, uh, uh, 600 million students in India because most of our people in India are young. It's a huge talent pool. And uh, all those people need to be tested when they go to school, when they go to college, the exams, and having um, someone to proctor the exams. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of money. Now they're switching it to this new technology uh, with a real-time monitoring technology to AI. So, and it's a 90% accurate. You don't need to have all those people. They can do it from the convenience of their own home. They test it and AI tells them if they're cheating uh, uh, or if the exam is not in the pro proctoring proctor, uh, process is not going well. So they, what happens is that, uh, you know, it eliminated a lot of costs while achieving new efficiencies that were not there before because this whole crisis created a necessity for improving technologies. <coughs> Number three, number four is demand on AI-based drug development. I think if you're in the biotech, I don't know how many of you in the audience are in the biotech related or pharma industry. And the things are getting much more uh, approved much faster, much because they're urgency driven. Um, and that could not only apply to drug treatment, but it could be in other areas also. Number five is virtual consultations. Uh, and this is especially true in the area of telemedicine and physical therapies and even uh, where people are just getting therapy from home just by watching TV and but also talking to doctors and being administered. I have a hospital in India that I started many, many years ago. It's a charity hospital for the poor people. I started a telemedicine unit no one wanted to go. They didn't want the machine. They didn't want to interface with the machine. They, I said, you know, you had the, you can talk to the best doctor if you come to my hospital with the study medicine, the best specialist in Australia and England and on, you get, you can get healed. But no one wanted to deal with it. But today, it is a preferred choice. Virtual consultations. Uh, besides saving time and getting the best quality, it's cheaper. It's so cost effective. Number six, personalized ARVR online shopping. 
Uh, we are using a lot of AR VR technology now, not only in the shopping areas, so you can buy things. And so that saves a lot of uh, travel time, parking and, and all this. And, uh, and, and the experiences that you have now, you, that could be enhanced and that could be new technologies where you really feel like you got more shopping done, you have seen more products, you have seen more varieties, and you have seen compared prices all at home compared to actually going and running around in the shopping malls. The AR VR technology is not only uh, being used in shopping malls. In India, uh, you know, the poor people in villages are, being, are using it, you know, to resurrect dead assets. For example, uh, I don't know in Poland, Poland is a wealthy country, but in uh, India, 70% of the people in India live in villages. And when they get an air conditioner, refrigerator, or a motorbike, once, or a laptop, even, once there's damage, once they cannot, uh, when it is broken, they can't fix it. You had to send it all the way to Delhi or take it there. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of expense. But today we resolved it through AR, VR technology. Your iPhone, a smartphone, any smartphone with a camera can put that right in front of a air conditioner, type in what's wrong with it. It'll speak to you and saying, this is model from the Hitachi make. These are the symptoms. So this is the remove this part. The skeleton needs replacing. Take this part and, and it'll order it for you. So many of these dead assets that are not being utilized, sitting in remote villages, are being resurrected and being put to use without calling a repairman and doing it your own. So this is a new opportunity and new technologies that you can have. So it's almost uberization of dead equipment. And uh, the other thing is the enhancing uh, gig services with robots. So uh, this has not happened yet, but they're using somewhat in healthcare. So instead of having a nurse come to you, real nurse, Many of these routine jobs could be done by ro robots and uh, they, they don't go on strike. They're 24 seven, uh, they do a great job. And especially in manufacturing, this could be done. And so I think we expect, this is already being employed. You know, we have a Tesla uh, factory here in, uh, near my home, a few miles away, I can go to the Tesla in Fresno, the, I'm um, not Fresno, uh, Fremont factory. If you go there, you don't see a single human being. All these robots that are doing two or three jobs, they'll put one tool down, bring another tool, and it's all quiet. There are no, there's no noise. And you see all these huge robots doing, and the cars are moving. And the only human being I see one, once or twice is a programmer making sure that uh, the lights are on and the switches are on. I mean, of course, that's an example. We have done, we've been doing that for a while now. I mean, this is nothing new, uh, but I think this um, gig services and robotics, I think will be much more, is a great opportunity for post COVID-19 because we're really recognizing the vision, the, the whole uh, uh, of this uh, opportunity. Live digital uh, events, I'm on right now, of course, uh, you know, we are speaking to you. Uh, I didn't turn the camera on because we, the bandwidth is a problem for us here right now. And so I thought well, it's a good that I just see my screen and see my picture. That's how I look like. And so we can just uh, go through the presentation. So this will be much more common. Uh, I'm doing this with my students and I did uh, conduct many conferences on live digital opportunities. Anything that you can uh, uh, start up or your business can add value, that's an opportunity. The other one, the esports made easy, uh, and uh, hybrid sports. So new kinds of games, since of sitting card games and doing all that, we can do this on internet. Even if your children are across in on the east coast, 
and uh, you know there are a lot of executives that are doing family games on the net and feel like and they're laughing and singing and you know even eating food in different places but you know it feels real um, some of the dangers that I want to talk to you about the going digital you know, digital is good but it is not um, uh, it has opportunities, but it also has dangers and cautions. And I just wanted to kind of point out to those to you that we take the necessary precautions. The first one is deception. Anytime you have digital and virtual and computerized, uh, in a lot of big per persona there and on it. So a lot of people get deceived and so this is how we need to assure our customers that they will they not be deceived and uh, there's transparency. And so trust is established. Number two is data security. You know, there's always this opportunity for data to be stolen. And uh, what we are saying here is that uh, we need to, anytime if we create a website or whatever, data security becomes very important. And uh, so that is a, a cost to us. Uh, number three is the complex cyber walls and gates. And our gates and walls are not taller than, you know, because if you try to build one, there's an, you know, there's a, a way that uh, the people can come through another side. So we just need uh, every day is becoming more and more complex. It means it's also expensive. You need to stay on the top of that. That's one risk and danger. Uh, crime and terrorism, people being held hostage, and uh, uh, that happens because of this. Uh, privacy concerns, so which means that in order to have the benefits, you need to give up some privacy. And how much privacy you want to give up is the so in India, on the telemedicine area, we, we, we say to people living in villages, yes, all your data is in the cloud, is accessible by any doctor in all of the world, but you hold the key and lock. You will decide whom to give it to, whom not to give it to. You lock it up when you don't want it to be things. So that kind of uh, privacy is important and security is also important. Those are some of the things that I want to say. And uh, of course, social disconnect. Well, you know, the, the, the sad thing is that uh, we can't shake hands with one another and give each other hugs. Uh, I think in France, they even people even, you know, kiss each other, right? That's not happening right now. And there's something wrong about that because we're all human beings. We want to be held since we're babies. Well, the day we die, we want that touch. And so that is many of the people who are dying because of COVID, you know, uh, their families see them from a distance, or some, sometimes not even see them because of the risk associated. Um, job insecurity and work overload. So which means most of the jobs uh, are becoming much more transient. Because you can capture global talent. You can get a guy from India who's a great, great programmer and you know his ratings are very, very high. You hire him compared to the guy who didn't show up to work today or the guy who you can't understand on the phone or on the, on the computer. So that also causes a new levels of anxiety. So you need to be very, very good uh, in whatever you do. And also the demands are more. I have not worked. I work, I'm, much, I'm working much harder now being at home, sitting on my couch than I have ever been in all my life. And you might say, well, you're home. You're not driving to work. You're not doing this thing and that thing. You don't need to dress up and you're saving all that time. Yes, but for some reason, there's work overload. The other day I called uh, the uh, chief innovation officer of Coca-Cola in Atlanta. I, uh, I have been trying to reach her for two months now. A good friend of mine and also a good uh, part of our Berkeley Innovation Forum. And she hasn't returned my calls. And I finally, she called me after two months and she said, Solomon, you can't believe. 
I have been home for two months. But I, but my day, it, my work is 24 seven because I connect with the world all over. I'm talking to India and so on. And my, my clock never stops. I can't even say hi to my family or sit. Even while at the table, I'm eating food and talking to them, talking to China. That's how busy we are. And she says, I don't know how to get out of this jail. Okay, those are some of the downsides. Eight, over-reliance, technology cracks. The problem is, in our businesses, in our personal lives, we are so dependent on technology, it becomes a trap. It becomes a, a, a prison. It, uh, if, when it is not there, when something goes off, we, a lot of time is wasted. We hurt, like today we are hurt because uh, I didn't connect with you on time. And so there were, I'm holding 32 people captive in the audience. And uh, that is not a good thing. And one day our uh, internet went out for the whole city in Pacifica, where I live. I couldn't call my mom. I couldn't call anybody because the, even the power went off, so I, I couldn't charge my phone. I had to walk two miles to my. What if there's some sort of a danger? I can't call the police. You know, the, so technology can be a trap, over-reliance. At least in India, hundreds and thousands and actual millions of people walked back to their villages on foot after this COVID shutdown. They moved from cities. All these are migrant workers working in slums under bad conditions in Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, and Chennai cities. But when a crisis like this, sitting in a hundredth floor in a building in a big tower in Mumbai doesn't feed you. The food has to get there from a village where there's fresh water, where it is grown. So people move back, they walk back on foot with children, with nothing. Many died, many got sick. They finally went back because they went back to the horse and buggy days because they were over relied on technology. Being close to a fresh water river with crops growing, with rice growth growing, is more safer than this modern technology. So when, when my students at Berkeley, you know, many MBAs ask me, what should I, where should I invest my money? Which stock? Professor Darwin, I should take my money and put it in. Which investment, is it gold or is it silver? I say all those are worthless. The only investment you want to make, you want to be secure, is land, real estate, next to a fresh water river, so you can grow food and eat and survive when the rest of the world starves. This is when our ancient civilizations in history, they built their cities right next to a river, right? Mesopotamia and Tigris rivers. Mesopotamia was built on Tigris and Euphrates, our ancient civilization. Then they moved to Egypt, the Nile River. Then they moved to China, the Yellow River. Then they moved to India, the Indus River and Ganges. You see, that is why river cities are the ancient cities where civilizations began. And that is the best investment. Uh, the other thing is digital addictions. You know, I'm amazed. Even though I'm sitting at home and would be busy I can't watch the news and when I, I don't have time for the news because I want to watch you know, what Trump is doing and what's happening. When I do, when I go to that to YouTube to watch, there are hundreds of other things that I'm addicted to now. I want to watch this. I want to see what's happening. What is their poll is saying? So it kills time. Oh, where did one hour go? 
with my left because I'm getting addicted to this stuff because digital addiction, and that's not. All right, uh, very good. Uh, this crisis that you are in and I'm in is good because it is a game changer, right? It calls for a human response. Right now you're sitting there and saying, I need to do something. But I want to do it responsibly. Second, it demands a solution. Whatever problem you're in, your business is in, you, it is demanding a solution. It stimulates your human creativity to foster innovation like it never did before. So a global crisis is a game changer. You need to be inspired to say, what should I do and how should I solve it? Number three, it creates opportunities because you look for things where you have never looked before to expand your market. People didn't want to go to India because it's a poor country, but now with 1.4 billion people in India, people are saying, hey, that's a great opportunity. I can sell a toothpaste. I can sell a mask. I can sell something. Make $1 on every mask on a single sale. If every Indian were to buy a mask from you for for two dollars and you make one dollar on each one. You know what that means? You made 1.4 billion dollars on a single sale, on a single product. That is the power of scaling. It's a new business model because most business models in the world, in America, in Silicon Valley, they want high margins, high margins, low volume. That doesn't work anymore. That's low hanging fruit. It doesn't take any brains to do it. Any monkey can do it. What you need is innovative business models. How can you be relevant to the people of the world? And the opportunities that I'm teaching our people here is a different business model, a new business model, low margins and high volume. There's power in there. That's what India has to offer. Even that's what China has to offer because there's huge poor populations of consumers. They're happy with little. You just make a penny, but all those pennies add up very quickly. The other one is requires collaboration. That's the other I mentioned to you earlier. You, in this world today, in a crisis situation, you don't care about, oh, these people are Chinese, they're my enemies. These are Russian people, they're my enemies. You don't think that way when the Martians in space are attacking you. When the Martians are attacking you, suddenly the Russians become your brothers, Chinese becomes your blood brothers, right? You all come together and work. And this crisis is teaching us that thing. It's an invisible enemy. You need to collaborate and work together and say, why don't you do this? You're good at this, I'll do this, and I'm good at this. So this open innovation, which I'm gonna talk a little bit if I have time in this presentation, as to how that principle works to help build what I call ecosystems. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is like your human body. Your human body is an ecosystem. You have different parts, lungs, river, I mean, liver, and kidneys, but they all work together in perfect cooperation and coordination. They don't work against each other. They work with each other and they work together for the benefit of the whole. And in a crisis like this, we don't care if the, you know, we only care about Martians. You know, we want to wipe them out, but we're all working together. And that is very necessary and an ecosystem approach where many come together, many diverse parts across industries, across disciplines come together to do it. And the good thing about an ecosystem is if one organ fails, you have another one. That's why God gave us two lungs. If one lung goes out, don't worry, we have another one, you see? You can remove half a liver and half a kidney, it still works. Sometimes when certain organs don't function, other organs in your body make up for the difference. That's how God made us. Help build ecosystems. 
Now, this is the global problem um, that uh, we are having, and uh, this uh, is something that uh, how opportunities are created uh, for value creation, because we are we don't live we live in a broken world. You know, this crisis post COVID, where COVID made it worse. We already have problems, and this COVID highlighted it to change the game. Number one problem is poverty in this world. Six billion people in the world are poor. That's 80% of the world. 3.4 billion people in this world struggle to meet basic needs, according to the World Bank, to put food on the table. These people are also hidden in villages and rural communities. They're not living in San Francisco or the cities. They are in rural areas. We have 650,000 villages in India. These are people disconnected from the rest of the world. They're not connected to the world. There are 1 million villages in China. I'm working with both these governments as to how you bring connectedness into this thing so everyone in those countries can have access to global markets and thrive and contribute because these people are like dead assets. They need to be resurrected and connected so they can contribute because they are created in the image of God and they have value and they can serve others and serve one another. The other thing that is happening in this world is inequality. The gap between the rich and the poor is growing Global. not just in the United States. Urban migration is contributing to this gap. Everybody wants to go to a city and live in a ghetto or in, a, you know, because in their own home, there are no jobs. They live in a substandard. Families are separated. One of the things that's happening in India is many of our people in villages work as slaves in, 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 uh, in uh, many of these Middle Eastern countries, in the oil places, you know, like their bonded labor. Many of them are being sent back now because of this COVID. They're now, in my village in India, we have 95,000 people who return back to the village now, uh, either from their local cities or from uh, the Middle East because they didn't want them in this crisis or situation. You see? And uh, so this gap, is, is a big one, and this urban migration we, at one time we thought is good, is turning out to be bad. Maybe what we should do is make villages sustainable, and that's what I teach, and that's the movement that I started at Berkeley, and I'm consulting with governments to make that happen. So people are happier in their own habitat, and uh, moms and dads and children are not separated. They can be together, and, and also there's more accountability and uh, even if I were to go all day and put some food on the table, I'm with my family and I'm happy. See, that's much more important now. Number three is globalization is reducing the bargaining power of the unskilled worker. When people from villages go to the Middle East or go to the uh, big cities, you know, they don't have any power to, to, to bargain. You know, they say, okay, you're a refugee here. So, you know, just shut up and take what I give you. Uh, so urbanization is not good because it increases pollution, congestion, crime is up in cities. Crime is, has always been up in cities because when people get together, sin multiplies. There's more sin committed when there's a critical mass of people. We think they'll be, all be filled with the Holy Spirit and singing praises to God. That doesn't happen. That happens more in villages, uh, right? A um, lot of waste, a lot of slums, health hazards. The other thing is loss of plant life. You know, we a lo lot more concrete in cities, right? Animal life, habitat. We're displacing animals that are very critical to our uh, livelihood and uh, sustenance. Diseconomies of scale, high cost of the environmental bill. We're messing up the environment, right? So therefore, unanticipated crisis is lack of preparedness 
uh, is, and then technology, perhaps those are the things. Now, let me stop here before I talk a little bit more. How are we doing on time and how am I doing? And I don't mind going on for another hour uh, because I have uh, been late on this thing. Uh, but uh, let me give me some feedback. Hello. 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 Yes, yes. How, how am I doing? Hello? Hello? Professor, are you here, there? I'm still here, but can you hear me? Uh, have you been hearing my lecture? Yes. Okay, all of you can see my slides? Yeah. We, we, now we can see Economic Policy Institute. Uh, okay, very good. By and, uh, uh, with productivity uh, uh, excellent. since uh, 1970s. Very good, and I can go on, right? Is it the right slide? Oh, very good. And uh, did we lose a lot of people? No. Oh. No, no, oh, I saw oh, right. We have a lot of people on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, I can go on that. Now we have about uh, 80 people on the presentation in different. Okay, and how much time do I have? Uh, how do you need? Yes, sir. I was I was wondering if I have enough time to finish my presentation. To, uh, to me, time is not a limit here for me, but I just wanted to make a good <laughs> morning for me here, Saturday uh, in California. Uh, I can go on, but I just wanted to make sure I want to be sensitive to your audience and the people who are right, listening. Now, now, now we have a plenty of questions to you. Uh, so uh, I, I think your presentation is um, so interesting that that uh, uh, we, we can hear about uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes more. I don't right. know. I can go, okay. I'll, I'll try to see I, what I can do in 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Now, I just want to show you this. This is a, a professor at Berkeley uh, who does research. And one of the things that's happening is the gap between the rich and the poor is increasing, the pay, right? Since 1950, we are better in 1950. We are better in 1960. and 1970, we are all better, you know, in terms of this uh, gap in uh, you know compensation now the gap is widening and it's becoming worse uh, this is a professor emmanuel Saez at uc berkeley my my neighbor uh, um, in the high school and he does this statistic every year and he's showing here 0.1 percent rich people take close to 190 times more money than the bottom 90%. This is in the US, right? And it is, um, look how big the gap is. You know, there's no fairness in this world. Uh, it's not, this is the United States now. Now, the gap is widening. You can see in this slide, same, uh, same professor, Emmanuel Saez said that since uh, 1960s, uh, you know, uh, 1969, we're much better off. We, even in 1983, we're better off, uh, 85, 1985. But since then, you can see the big gap. Top 1%, you know, take more, more money away than the bottom 99%. That's not very good news, right? And it's, growing. it's a growing trend, which means it's going to cause a lot of... Uh, social unrest in the world, a lot of riots, a lot of strikes, that's not good. 
and then this is not only here in the in the US but uh, even in Europe where you are OECD report on globalization talks about rising inequity it reduces the bargaining power of the unskilled worker right top 10% Old same amount of wealth as the bottom 90%. That's not good. And only 3% of the wealth is held by 40% of the population. So that big difference is not healthy to have a peaceful world. Let's see. I'm to, let me talk about India, which is another economy where we have some good data, good information. We don't have good information on China. That's why I put a question mark. In India, according to the Oxfam report, nine richest people in India own more than the bottom 50% of the entire population. That's not good news. The other bad news is nine people, uh, nine people own more wealth than 600 million people combined. You know, the big rich people at they're the Warren Buffetts of India. So 1% of India's population owns 75% of the entire wealth in India. See, that is not good. And But that's not, I just highlighted two countries, India, because I'm from there originally, even though I've lived here since I was 16 years old in America, but I'm original from India. So I, that's of interest to me. And, uh, and here's Europe and the United States. So we, you know, we are not in a, in a, a good spot, a lot of things can happen, okay? Now, these are some things for you, for you to think. You know, you're a business person sitting and listening to me. These are some questions for you to evaluate yourself, you evaluate your business. How do you create value for yourself in this post-COVID world? The second question I want you to think about, what innovative business models can you create with some of the tools I mentioned to you in this world? How do you leverage your, the knowledge you have in history? Because there's knowledge that you already built. So if you're 30 years old, for 30 years, you have built knowledge that's in your head, in your experiences, in your business. How do you take the tacit knowledge and how do you leverage it? And how do you do your corporate experience? With many, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a specialty that you know. How do you leverage that? How do you leverage your resources? You know, every company has six resources. One is human resources, your people. How do you use them effectively? You have physical resources. You may have a facility or a building or, or you know, a restaurant. You have physical resources. You have financial resources, right? Investments, what have you, you have a return on those. Then you have uh, intellectual resources or knowledge assets. You know, it could be a trademark or an IP or, a, you know, an algorithm that you have, right? You have knowledge assets, right? Then you have supply chains, right? A network, distribution channels, right? You have a lot of customer bases that you have that is also a resource. How do you take all this and sit down, take a pen and paper, do a business model canvas and, and, and say, how am I going to leverage all this, right? How do you work with your competitors and partnerships? These are things that I want you to start thinking about as you go into this world. Uh, think about your, don't be afraid of your competitors. You know, there's, I will tell you a quick story. Uh, Clorox and Procter & Gamble are um, enemies. They're competitors. One day, even though they're enemies, they started working together. Clorox brought this, uh, bought, uh, made an acquisition of a startup that had this, uh, uh, plastics, you know, the seal, you know, plastic seal bags. They have a great distribution channel. They can sell that all over the world. However, they didn't have 
scientists, the technology, the experts to make that better and to make it adaptable to many other things, other products to put into the bag. But Procter & Gamble has scientists. So here's a company that are, the competitor has all the knowledge. They have the distribution channel and the IP or the, or the because they bought it. They can do two things. One is they work together or sell it to, or Clorox can sell their IP to P&G and say, okay, that's it. Or they can compete and they will lose. Both will lose. Instead, what they did was they created a third company, you call it joint venture. You know, Clorox invested 80%, P&G invested 20%, and uh, Clorox gave the IP, and, uh, and then you had uh, P&G lent the scientists, and they used Clorox's distribution channel to distribute those products globally. See, here are two competitors coming together because one had strength, the other one, and they both converged, right? It is almost like making love to your enemy and producing babies that are successful. That's what this joint venture did. The chief financial officer of Clorox was in my office with the dean a few years ago. And I said, how is the deal going? He said, you know, this is so successful. We are ahead of schedule. We're making more money on this. Even though we are two competitors, this joint venture is bringing in a lot more money. We are so impressed with it. We went back to Procter and & Gamble and said, you know, I, we know we hate you because you're a competitor, but you're great in bed. We can make more babies. You see, there's a lesson there for you. So in this environment, start thinking about your competitors and saying, you know, is there a way I can work with them? And when you have a successful case, call me because I can write a case on it, put it into the Harvard Magazine, and then, uh, then you and I can uh, work together on that. All right. Now, this is um, uh, a place where we have, um, you know, I have four frameworks that I teach. And I was teaching to a group of Russian executives uh, a couple of months ago. And I taught them four frameworks. And we may not have time for that today to go over this. Maybe we have to do it another time. And, um, you know, I have the business model framework. I want to say a few words about that. I have... Uh, the leadership framework, the open innovation framework, you need to understand how what that is as a business person, right? Uh, so you have the business model, you have the open innovation framework, and then you have the triple helix framework, uh, which is another thing that which I use for India working with governments. Because when you want to work and be successful, you can't work alone. You got to work with governments, you got to work with universities, you got to work also with your fellow businesses. It's called Triple Helix. I wish I can talk about that for an hour, right? And the last one is leadership. If you don't have the right person leading your company, you're going on a bus to nowhere. All right, what I can do now is I can stop here and uh, take some questions. And uh, let me see what I can do. Maybe I can uh, stop sharing and then I can see you all maybe. Uh, let me see if I can see. Can I see you all? I don't think I can see you all, right? Yeah, I guess. No, it's, it's webinar, so, so we cannot see. Everybody. Uh, but I see that there are 30 me. people on the, on the call, right? Yeah. And uh, because, maybe because. the best thing here for them uh, is uh, if they can, uh, do, you have a, uh, do you have a good, good moderator who can take some of these questions and ask me and I can speak I to will, you? I will ask you. I, okay, I, why don't you ask me and then that it. way uh, that I don't need to read. I, I see a lot of questions there. But if I yeah. and read all those questions, I will, 
I will choose <laughs> I will for you time. because I have, I have a few questions from uh, also from Facebook and from Twitter, so there are a lot of them. Uh, is it possible you to turn on your camera to, to steal? I think it will be. You know, I, I, uh, let me not do that because it, it will mess up the thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I'm afraid uh, no uh, we, are all, we already started a mess, so I think... Uh, you need to be satisfied with my picture now, but there are a lot of videos. Yeah, your picture is great, so it's okay. Sorry, sorry, yeah, sure. sorry for the question. So uh, the first question uh, we have, um, is it possible to be ready for the next crisis? Uh, it's unlikely to predict any huge global crisis. That's the issue. How do you think? Is it possible oh, to you, be... You're saying, is it possible to be ready for the next crisis? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think uh, <clears throat> it is possible because uh, the, the problem is we have uh, prospered as a civilization, both in the West and the East, from the industrial era. And, uh, and we haven't changed very much, even in our schooling and education. Most of the graduates we produce in India are totally worthless to the current market right now, uh, many of them, because... Uh, we are not preparing them uh, for the jobs today and the work today. And so, you know, we still do very good in India by producing good uh, programmers as well as uh, doctors. But in many of the other areas, you know, we have uh, kids with a lot of degrees, but not relevant to match. So what we need to do, the same thing is happening in other places, is um, we need to become more digital because the digital is the nervous system of the world. If you want to be connected uh, to the world, you need to become digital. And otherwise you will be like an organ in the body that's not getting blood supply, not getting signals and you atrophy and you have to you know, extract it and throw it away. Okay, thank, thank you very much. The next question. From, from Professor Thomas Schmal uh, uh, about about uh, one plus one uh, is eleven uh, mm. equitation. Could you um, say us uh, what arguments are you to be used uh, in order to competitors cooperate? Yes, the argument for that is um, is that uh, that is how God made us, made us to work with one another and we are, each one of us is unique, not only as people, but also as organizations. And uh, the reason sometimes we compete is because it's healthy. It doesn't mean that we can't work together. For example, uh, there's another company, it's called Sanofi and uh, uh, a company that, uh, a very large company that knows all the FDA approval process. There's a small biotech company that came up with a drug and heart medicine that is more effective than the Santa Fe um, biotech company had. It's a competing. But this little company does not know the FDA process. They don't have the money. They don't have the resources. They don't have a distribution channel. So when this little company and this big company work together, even though they're competing on the same drug, when they work together, the drug came out much quicker, much faster, and both benefited and both prospered. You see, that's the argument, is you have something that I don't have, even though I'm a little guy, you know? And the thing is it takes guts to do it. And the selfish nature in all of us is it's mine, I want to keep it, I don't want to share it. The sharing economy is a beautiful thing because that is how, that is what the kingdom of God is like. Heaven is everyone will be people, Jesus said, will be serving one another. They'll be competing to serve one another. So therefore we just need to make sure that we get along here on earth before we go to heaven. And we need to be trying to say, how do we work together in ways that we are different, but yet complementary. And that mindset is very hard to achieve because we live in a very selfish and sinful world and we need to unlearn it. It's part of our DNA, which we need to unlearn. Okay. 
Thank, thank you very much for the answer. And my next question. Do you think that isolation will be our constant companion, even if we manage uh, to develop and give people a vaccine? A vaccine. Uh, do you think that something will change after vaccine in our current life? <clears throat> yes, I. This is what uh, my 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 own feeling is. Post COVID nineteen is a, a symptom, uh, and uh, because we live in such a globalized world where things spread, not only bad news spreads fast, but even disease spreads very fast because we live in close quarters and uh, we do things, we got used to it. We have been, I'm glad that uh, it didn't happen for the last hundred years or so. We are happy uh, that uh, nothing happened. But I think from going forward, I, I think we will be hit with things that we will, will, that will be taken by surprise. We'll not have time to prepare. And uh, we need to be on guard for these sort of things. That is why my first a few slides talk about this, is that we need to be as best prepared as we can digitally and be more connected. Just imagine, you know, post COVID is one thing where we're locked in our homes, we're not moving. You know, our California governor said, stay home, don't go any place, right? We have been doing this for a while now. We're locked in, we're a pigeon in a cage. Just imagine internet goes away. What will you do then? Some smart guy sitting in, uh, in the mountains of Tibet or the mountains of Himalayas, a bright scientist, figured out a way how to cause havoc in this world of internet. And he holds the key because the, today, the person who controls the code controls the world. That is the future that awaits us. Okay, uh, next question from uh, Mirella Panek. Uh, how to convince young people that they should be interested in social impact startups, which are solving the most uh, urgent solutions? Yes, I think uh, this is one thing I work with a lot of young people. A lot of young people have uh, ideas that are very digital, much more in nature. I think if you put a bunch of old people and young people together, young people will become much more relevant uh, solutions. But I think this is where the government should commit some money because it's a better investment. I know we throw a lot of money away. The government's put a lot of budgets in so many areas, but one area that uh, the government should need to spend and incentivize in a proper way that it doesn't get abused is uh, this uh, knowledge creation. Knowledge creation is such an important thing and knowledge should be created by people who think differently and uh, in varieties of ways. And we don't put enough investment on that. A lot of these startups starve and there's not enough encouragement. Even if someone has an idea, no one wants to sit. They don't even have patience to sit long enough to listen to them. I think the government needs to think about this very importantly to build the infrastructure of minds and not physical infrastructure knowledge infrastructure to solve human problems is far more important than putting money in all these other things. And why did Silicon Valley become such a great place for economic wealth? Is because the government of the United States during war times, during the Cold War, World War I, World War II, Korean War, all these wars, they put money, seed money in, in Stanford, in Berkeley, MIT, and said, you know, create knowledge, create knowledge. Because we, we, in order for us to survive in this world, we need knowledge so that we need to overcome the adversaries. That knowledge was classified as top secret. See, during war times, more than 
of the knowledge that PhD thesis at Stanford and Berkeley was classified as top secret. Why? Because that is the leverage we had. And then what happened when the war ended, when the Cold War ended and all the other wars ended, that same knowledge is used, applied into new things, commercial products, radios, microwaves, cars, and so on. So, so knowledge is always good, but it is the right use of knowledge, which is called wisdom, is important. We use knowledge, it could be for destructive purposes, but if your heart is right, if your heart is in the right place, if you love your fellow man, like Jesus said, you use it for the right uses and that's called wisdom. And that's what we lack now. Okay, so uh, next question is from our colleague from our company, uh, Malgorzata Sobo, about uh, inequity in the world. Rising inequity in the world, maybe it's a, a proof that all those support programs, distribution of goods, equality campaigns, financed, heavily financed by governments and global agendas, for instance, UN, just said, what other evidence is needed? It seems that more social aid, more poverty and unhappiness, it's getting worse year by year. Maybe more pure traditional capitalism is needed right now. What do you think? Yeah, I think maybe if you can ask me that question very simply, I'll understand it because I know you said a lot and uh, because okay. of connection something, but put it simply, you're saying that there's a lot of unhappiness. In the, 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 the question is, that, that maybe we don't need now uh, all uh, support programs and distribution of goods, but uh, maybe uh, pure traditional capitalists will uh, solve all, uh, all yes. not all, but more problems now. What do you think? See, this is a, I mean, this is a good question uh, that you asked, because see, these uh, hundreds of millions of people who left uh, Mumbai, Delhi, and walked back to the villages. They're exactly doing the same thing. We don't want all this stuff. We just want to go be with our families and in this crisis be supported by a community that loves us and receives us and be together where our roots are and we'll go out every day and uh, cut some food, grow some rice and uh, have some cows and milk and then be happy. You see, but government doesn't incentivize that. that. That's a problem. The government incentivizes us to produce more GDP. And GDP is in the mind of, it's, a, it's another algorithm. You know, you can't feel it, you can touch it, you can't eat it, but, and, and it doesn't produce happiness. Uh, let me tell you one quick story. I work with a, a government called uh, Arunachal Pradesh. It is between China and India border up in the Ham Himalayas. These are tribal people that have been isolated from civilization. The chief minister of the state put me in a jeep one day and he said, I'm going to send you to this beautiful place called uh, uh, Zero. And uh, it's a great place because there's all this kiwi fruit there, and there is so much uh, organic farming. You know, if we could take some of that produce and, and this and market it and improve the GDP of our, of our state, it'll be great. So I went down there, I took eight hours to go down there to the Himalayas. Very, then I found some of the happiest people in the world there. Very simple. And I asked them, uh, oh, you do organic farming. This is great. You have fish over here, you have, uh, you have kiwi. Why don't you do more? They said, no, we only want to do only enough just for our family. Yeah, but don't you want to do maybe 10 times more so you can sell to your neighbor? 
He said, no, no, no. We just want to do enough for our family. But but don't you want to get more money? She said, no, 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 we don't want money. We just want to do it just for enough family. We all go out and we do organic farming and we kiwi and so on. We don't want this commercialization. But don't you want money? He said, no, no, no. We just want to be with our family and just eat for the day. Then I came back to the chief minister and I said, you know, why do you want to create a smart village out of this whole thing and invest a lot of infrastructure and money when the people are happy? But he said, yeah, I know people might be content and maybe happy there. But I have a note from the prime minister of India saying, well, we need to improve the GDP of my state. So there's something for you to think about and take away. I cannot hear you because uh, you have your microphone closed. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the answer. And uh, now, now is one of the um, last questions, and I would like to uh, ask you uh, the, the uh, more private question: Did your life story and your family uh, history affect how you? Uh, perceive global economy. Uh, you have no anger at the uh, inequality between rich and poor countries? Yes, I, you just cut out here and there. Would you uh, say the question again? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the question is about your uh, private story. We, we know because uh, we've read. Uh, about what is it? Private? Europe. Private enterprise? Uh, private history story is about your family and and the story about your uh, grandma. Uh, oh, grandma, uh, yes, yes, yes. The untouchables. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, untouchables. Yeah. Yes. And uh, how do you think? Uh, is this uh, family history affect how you? perceive global economy uh, and uh, if, yes if it's yes uh, you know one of the reasons that i started smart villages is because i come from a village in india that is given to the untouchables uh, where nothing grew uh, you know these people are have committed so many bad crimes in the previous life. In reincarnation, we believe these people are banned there. So my grandmother came from there. See, uh, the reason smart villages are so important is because uh, she created the first smart village. She was uh, a child bride. Uh, at the age of six, she was married to a man who was 20 years older than her. Her father didn't want her. They rejected her. They She was not very having any babies till she was 40. So she had no other opportunity to just to kill herself. And she drowned herself in this river called Godavari. And an Englishman, a missionary, saved her life and said, don't do this. But she said, I have no hope. I'm uneducated. I am a scavenger. I take clean public bathrooms. And there are, no one likes me, and I, there's no the chances of my my success and survival, and to make it in this world are zero. But but the story goes on to say, even though the chances are zero, she started a global business. That she exported lace to England, because to Burma. She created many entrepreneurial business, seven businesses in, in, in country. And she became the largest employer in that village. So what that story tells, I think some of your people, it's a long story, I don't have time to do it. But uh, what I want to say is the human DNA that God created is so intelligent in his design of things, God's design of things is better than a PhD. It's better than a million PhDs. It is intelligent, it's resilient, it's adaptive, but all it needs is fair treatment. If you give them access, see this missionary 
who pulled up my grandmother and he taught her how to read and write, which untouchables were denied in those days. He taught her how to add and subtract. That is all that she needed to start a global business. And she got paid in pounds from British people. She educated her son with the money and blessed many people. And her son became the first man to get a PhD as an untouchable in the state where education was denied for those kind of people. Even then he didn't get a job there. So President Nixon gave him an asylum here in the United States to be a scientist. See, what, what that tells you is that um, in crises like this, you know, some of that element that uh, what God put into us comes out and you can bless many, many people. This particular woman, uh, my grandmother, was so persecuted because she, that she had to leave the country and she went to Burma. When the Burmese were bombing, when Japanese were bombing Burma, they all walked back on foot from Burma to the village in India because at least they can grow something and eat food. So my inspiration came from there that the basic necessities is fresh water. Only 1% of the world's water is fresh that sustains life on this planet. We need to preserve it. And land where it grows rice, that's where we eat food on the table. Those two are the most essential things. And you don't need a PhD to do that. But you need access, you need fair treatment. And that is why I believe in smart villages, because it is not building infrastructure, but it's building people by giving them access to global markets. And that's what I believe. Okay. Thank you. And the last question from Bogdan Pilavsky. The crisis we are in has heavily damaged the life work balance, especially for those working remotely. Is this going to return to the normal, even if we call it the new normal, or is it to the end up in another unplanned Schumpeter-like Schumpeter -like, uh, disruption? If no return to the world as we know it, we knew it. Sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I, well, I read a report the other day that uh, it was a survey done with uh, several hundred CEOs, and all of them, the consensus is that uh, it takes about year 2022 to, for us to come back to some normalcy, provided there's no other crisis in the horizon. The problem is there are so many unknown things that we are never prepared for, and we don't know how that is going to affect us. And as I said in my first couple of slides, this globalization, what we glorified at one time, and this interconnectedness that we once thought was good for us, it turned out to be accelerating the problem rather than helping the problem. It's, it's accelerating the bleeding rather than stopping the bleeding. And so that is, the, that is a problem. I mean, look at uh, the United States of America. We were the most prosperous, created more jobs, you know, and, and Trump goes on the list. But look at what we're facing. This interconnectedness, globalization, and sometimes those digital tools, which is the tree of knowledge, is sometimes a curse for us than really a help. You know, but that's what we wanted. You know, that's what, uh, when Eve saw the tree of knowledge, she wanted IP. And that's the problem. And the, the thing is, tree, knowledge is good, but there's a right use of knowledge, like I said, which is wisdom. And so I don't think we will return back to uh, normalcy in the same way that we were once, because sometimes when people go through some disaster, you know, they, they, they change and, and the world has changed. And, uh, you know, like you talk, talk to any victim, like a rape victim or whatever, forever they're changed in their mindset. They are on guard. And, and I think 
we are facing such a world today. Okay, so uh, Solomon, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are you, are you <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sorry for the delay. Are you calling from Poland? Yeah. I see. Okay. I, okay. Most of, uh, I see. I was calling very, very from good. Poland, so now you have my mobile number sure. <laughs> uh, in, you. your, in your telephone, uh, and I have yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. I hope um, that, that uh, our future will be uh, positive, and uh, I'm optimistic. Sure. And I just want to thank all all the participants who have waited for me, even though I was thirty minutes late, and uh, and uh, and for their intently listening and uh, and staying with me. And uh, God bless you all. We have we have uh, um, five more uh, questions. I will send you by email because they are quite interesting. Interesting. Sure. Too. Sure. So. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to our audience. I, you know, in in Poland uh, tomorrow we will have a very important day because we have a, an election for president. Um, so I think everybody has to go sleep and think over uh, everything, and we will go to vote. Uh, yeah, tomorrow. President Trump, uh, I think entertained your. Uh, Prime Minister, right from Poland. <laughs> I can now to 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 tell anything because now we have a, uh, we, we cannot uh, um, say anything. about it. <laughs> yeah, sure. no worries. <laughs> we, can, no worries. we cannot no worries. engage uh, anything. So thank you very much. Ho hope to see and to talk with you in the future. Bye bye. Okay. And thank you for your okay. time. Bye bye.